Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to speak uh, to you this morning on where, where my interests merge, the idea of innovation and technology merging with the agri sector. And um, Michelle briefly went through my, my background, which is pretty much around uh, supply chain, business, agribusiness, and now agri-tech that we're, we're getting into, as well as working in, in ag innovation in, in UIGs, where um, I work with John. And apologies for the dog, dogs barking in the background. They'd only do that right at the key time, quiet all morning. Um, so what I want to do, and it, it blends nicely with the end of Fiona's talk, and we're, we keep talking about farmers. How are farmers going to adopt technology? And I want to go through a case study with farmers and I will want to look at one particular segment and see what role can blockchain with my level of understanding at the moment of it, can it play in that sector? And what I want to do is I want to look at a struggling industry and can blockchain provide hope? So we're looking at probably doing the most um, ambitious thing of all times in this country and turning sad farmers into happy farmers and cannot be done with a new technology. Because when I hear the word blockchain, I hear of a great novel new technology that's searching for needs and problems in the industry. So it's coming from another industry and it's looking for needs and problems in this agri sector that, uh, that we're looking at today. There's no doubt the needs are there uh, for such, such a technology. But what I want to get it more into uh, today is the motivation. Where does the motivation lie, maybe at a farm level? And I want to look at the supply chain. Now, through times in this talks, it might feel as if, where is he going with this in terms of blockchain? But bear with me, uh, hopefully it'll come together near the end. The in struggling industry I want to look at uh, this morning is beef farming. Over 100,000 farms, and uh, Fiona even alluded to the, in, even in the Board B scheme, there's 51,000 farm, farmers in that scheme. It's worth about 2.5 billion. Interesting law, it's, de it's dependent on direct payments. So 74% of the average, average income on a beef farm comes from direct payments, and it is classed as a vulnerable industry. So this is all from an independent report last year, but it's a significant contributor to the economy. So in lay terms, it's a very important industry, but it's a very vulnerable industry at the moment. So as well as these things, it's looking at the uh, move away from eating meat in the, in the Western world. People are seeing a, a reduction in their meat intake on a daily basis as being good for the environment. So it's seen as environmentally unsustainable. Um, so it's, it's a problem industry. And I, this is the one I'm most interested in because I have a beef farm in Roscommon. We've changed the business model. I'm going to go through that in a few minutes. Um, but I want to look at the value propositions of these type of farms and where blockchain could actually play a role and where particularly the motivation for these types of farmers could lie. I want to look at two perspectives. This is the first one. If you Google beef farming in Ireland and go to images, this is what you see. Um, last year, you'll all remember that this industry was on its knees, and um, still is, um, and they went out on mass pro protesting against the price of, of um, they're getting from the factories. And the middle picture there on the top would, would really sum up what they're looking for. They're just looking for fair trade. They want a fair go at, at this industry. Um, so it's a very unhappy production level um, workforce at the moment. The other perspective I always like to look at is this one. It's the lovely lush green image we push out there of, of Irish farming. How it's grass fed, it's sustainable, it's all these lovely things. And this is only like, there's as many pictures in this as there is in anything else. It's the way we just market it. And if you look this evening at adverts on the, on the TV or when you're in the supermarket, we push farmers out to the front of the marketing saying we buy from farmers, where we engage with farmers. And this is, this is the type of perspective we put out there. So those two perspectives, Angry and unhappy farmers on one side and a feel good direct from farm marketing on the other side has me confused with this industry completely. Um, but I want to look at where blockchain can play a role in this because if you take the supply chain and you pick out who are the most important elements in this. Now everybody plays a role, but who are the most important? For me, it's the person producing and it's the consumer. There's ways and means of getting product from A to B there but they are the two most important components in any supply chain. It's who produces the food 
and then who who's consuming it. And at the moment, our supply chains are normally dictated by shareholders at a corporate level. That means margin and profit is, is dictating production systems, whereas it should be nutrition, health and, and sustainability. So I want to discuss this morning, and can blockchain play a role in this relationship between producer and consumer? Now, weirdly, I want to look at the business model of farming to actually figure out this, this conundrum is we need to understand what's ha happening at a farm level that has the mouth protest and en masse and has the, this lovely, shiny, lovely front end marketing campaigns going as well. And, and what, what's going on there? So I'm going to look at the business model of an average beef farmer in, in Ireland at the moment. And then I'm going to look at an alternative to that. This is just the business model canvas. It'll become obvious to those of you that don't know it. Um, but I, there's just nine components of a business model here that I want to look at. And when we look at beef farming in Ireland, their value proposition is high yield protein. And you might think that their customer segment is various consumers at the front end, the, the back end, but it's not. They're looking at meat processors are looking for high yield protein. That's what they're looking for because it, the confirmation on beef animals is very important for yield and efficiency at a meat processing level. So this is the value proposition they're currently dealing with and these are their customers their channels then how they get to to the customers is there's a couple of options they can go to local marts they can use a buyer you can just discuss them as customers but they're not their channels or they can go direct, direct if they have the infrastructure themselves normally when i do this talk um at chagas or anywhere um, i normally stop at this point and if it's a group of farmers in particular it's very interesting to say what is the customer relationship between you as a farmer and a meat processor, particularly if you have dairy farmers or beef farmers in the room? And the reaction is quite extraordinary. You get every curse known to man because customer relationships, there's little or none in the beef industry at the moment. And you've seen all the pictures that I showed at the start, and that uh, typifies what's going on. And it's the customer relationships piece here that is critical when we're talking about a technology like blockchain. So how do we develop a common view of the truth or co-creation when this relationship is so bad at the moment? Well, we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. So our revenue streams for this business model is sale of goods, direct payments, and then quickly going through the other activities or the other parts of the business model. Key activities on this business is production. We're production only. We don't... Not that we don't care about other things, but we don't do sales and marketing. We don't do any of this. Everything's revolved around pro production and managing that process. Our key resources are our land machinery, our farm, and normally an overdraft. And then you have key, key partners like Chagas Borbia, Daffam, and your cost structure then is where all your money goes. When you look at these nine um, blocks, I'm sorry I'm, I'm speeding through it, but I just I don't want to take up too much time on this part. You look at a business model here and normally, if, if we were in a room, I'd be asking, what is the problem with this business model? Or what does the farmer control here? And the answer is, on the left-hand side, there's some control in the elements of the internal components of the business. But the only thing a beef farmer controls is their decision to be a beef farmer. It's this value proposition. They do not control the customer segments. They don't have much choice in that. The customer relationship is non-existent. Their channels are their channels, and they particularly don't um, control their revenue streams. Now, any investor you give a business model like this to, they'd walk away and they'd actually laugh back at it because a business model that's so uncontrollable, it means there, there's little, it's unsustainable as well in an in a economic um, terms. So the immediate question you asked then was for this sector, where does blockchain come into this? Where is the, the bandwidth? If we're not talking to our customers, if we're not engaged in the supply chain, what's going on? So to, to get around this, I want to show you another version of this business model, which is the exact same farm, um, and it's our farm. So this is the business model we used to work with in 2008. And then in Castlemine Farm, we changed the business model by just changing one component of this, and it completely changes everything. And I want to go through that, and then I want to look at, okay, where can blockchain play the role here? So... In Castlemine Farm, we decided we were just going to ch change the customer segment. We decided meat processors weren't our customer anymore. We wanted to go to the users at the, at the back end and sell direct to them. So then we described them differently. They're foodies, young mothers, high-end chefs, 
and that list actually goes on as many customer segments at the mo at the moment. But that changed our value proposition as a firm. And the two key words is trusted and traceable. Now, this is not our interpretation. It's not an assumption. It's after 10 years in business, we've spoke to our customers numerous times over. Why do they come to our, our farm shop and buy produce office? Is they trust and traceable? And it's, it's beautiful. It's nice, all those other things. But the first things that come up is always trust and traceable. Um, and that's something that the consumer was looking for actively. We entered a market that was probably one of the most competitive, as highly regulated as aviation, um, as perish, nothing more perishable by our newspapers on, on, the, on the shop shelves. And how do you make, make a traction in that market? Well, you make it if you hone in on a value proposition that's, that, that there is a need for. And this there was a big need for is that idea of trust and traceable. Now we ho didn't hone in on it consciously, it was accidental that we discovered this. But nonetheless, we did. Just quickly looking at the rest of the customer, the rest of the business model, our customer relationships now is different. We open up the farm to build this trust. So we have open days, farm works, websites. We'll try to show everything that's going on. And this might start to sound familiar when it comes to this idea of building trust and opening up the, the data sets as, as such as to what's going on at farm level. This is building our, our, um, our value proposition. Our channels then is we, we had to build our own retail outlets. We, we sell online, which has boomed this year uh, for obvious reasons, and we deliver to restaurants. And then where we get all our control is the, so, the, the goods are sold with a rule of 34% uh, gross margin. And then there's direct payments as well. But we've taken control of this, this business model. Some of the other parts, key activities. So we're not just a production-based business anymore. We need to be good at processing sales and marketing and management. So we've, we've taken in the, with the need for a lot more skill sets than just production-based um, farming. And our key resources would have expanded to, for this business model. Our key partners as well, there's other people we have to deal with on a, a daily basis. And the, the negative part is the cost structure would have expanded. So this is the business model, model of Castle Mine Farm. And when, and, but the thing you have to remember with this, it's the exact same farm as the previous uh, business model I showed you, where there was no control, there was no engagement with our, with our customers. Um, and if there was, it was a frictionless uh, thing, where to taking control and building the entire business model on trust and traceability and honing in on a, a, a need in the market for that. Um, so I want to just give you those two business models to set the scene for, okay, let's look at the supply chain for both of these and see where blockchain can actually play a role in, in this industry. And see, can is there a future in this industry for blockchain? Is there a future for the industry? Number one is, and where can blockchain play a role? So I want to look at the supply chain of the first model I showed you. So the uncontrollable average beef, beef farm. And 98% of farms in Ireland work off this business model. 75% of those farmers are working off farm uh, for income. And I, I do believe there's a proportion of those farmers actually using their off farm income to sustain the farm as well. So if we look at this simple supply chain, so you have Farmers have their inputs, they go to processors, there's a logistics step, and we go out here to retail and food service. Normally, outside of a farmer's market or growing your own, you are requiring all your food in either some form of retail or some, from, some form, of form of food service. This is your average uh, and uh, supply chain. For blockchain to fit into this, you will need to, as you call it, uh, call, Fiona call it, co-creation will be required. So farmers and their data management system need to feed, feed into a blockchain, so do processors, so do logistics in some way, possibly retailers. Um, but I, for me, that's where you see the benefit actually come out. Um, so think of the business model and the customer relationships. How likely is this gonna happen in this industry at the moment? I would argue this will take a big stick uh, and nothing else for it at the moment. So I'm more interested in how can we use a carriage-based approach to this? Um, so the outcome then would be your blockchain would uh, help your supply or you help your, your compliance part. So your government agency up here could be bored via. So it'll actually be doing um, a good service for you there. But also going to your consumer 
uh, level at and building that trust and traceability for the projects. That's what the ideal panacea that we're looking at here is blockchain slots into the industry. Each stakeholder actually plays the role. Government agencies get their compliance uh, box ticked and consumers can see a lovely, can see that lush green grass fed beautiful and farmers turn from sad farmers to happy farmers. Uh, this is not going to happen without uh, a serious amount of leadership, a serious amount of negotiation, a serious amount of um, sticks beating farmers to actually engage in this and processors and logistics. None of them want to engage in this presently. So let's look at the supply chain for model two, the model that I showed you that we changed cast to mine firm. Um, we've taken control of processing and logistics ourselves. So all that comes in under one umbrella and blockchain actually enables this model because remember our model is built on trust and traceability. So for this type of model, blockchain just fits in and it actually provides a lovely service in that customer relationship um, uh, component because we are trying to build trust and traceability. That's what it's all about. So a technology coming along, you go, yeah, that's that's great. But there's an argument, maybe we don't even need to invest in it because we have this trust and traceability built up. But um, but then you go, yeah, well, it's, it's only building it even more. It's actually cementing this. So this type of model is built for blockchain to actually come in. This, this is, these would be the innovators and early adopters of this type of technology as, as I understand it. But this model is very difficult to scale. So 98% of farmers on the old model, only 2% are on a different type of model like this. The key activities is the key to the, in the business model is that is the key to this. We have educated farmers to be production-based um, people. We're world-class at that. We're world-class at production. We're world-class at educating for production, but we haven't given skill sets around process and sales and marketing, all these other components that that's required to actually scale different business models in the industry. So to conclude as such, um, I am saying farmers should embrace blockchain. Bee farmers should embrace blockchain and own it. Why should they do that? The farming community need to minimize the control the rest of the supply chain have, and they need to build the relationships of trust with the users. So they need to stop focusing on the customer and actually start focusing on the user. And a great way to build en masse for a full industry, for a full nation nearly, even with your export clients, build relationships of trust with the users is as a sector, you take on something like blockchain, uh, your users see that, they want your product. This then, in theory, should move farmers to a position of power because they've no power at the moment. They're too dis distributed. All the powers with the processes, processors and retailers because they're the economic um, concentrations of power. If they embraced blockchain, they could move to a position of power that will force the supply chain to react and engage with them meaningfully. That, that is the theory of what I'm saying here. Their business model is not conducive to actually taking on blockchain at the moment, um, but also they have no power, they have no control of their business model in the beef sector. But something like blockchain could be a game changer for that. If they were to take this on and build the trust with their users in some way. Open up the doors of Irish agriculture, show the users whatever it is, as John says, the antibiotics uh, use. There's nothing to hide in farming. That's the other thing. There's, the, we have good production systems and they may start to monitor the carbon that's beginning to happen. There's a lot of good stories at Irish farming that needs to be told to the users. And if the rest of the supply chain um, start blockchain and actually force the farmers, if retailers force processors, force farmers into it, farmers will continue to have no control, but their motivation should be around building trust with their users, and then they'll be in a position of, of um, power. So to, in conclusion, I, what I am saying from a farmer perspective, uh, and as a farmer, if the beef industry at a producer level, it should embrace blockchain immediately because it's a game changer. But why should they do that? To build a relationship of trust and traceability with their users. And if they do that, they will generate the power to force 
the supply chain to engage in theory. So that uh, briefly in about 20 minutes is my interpretation of why the farmer should care about blockchain. Thanks a million folks. I, I can take one uh, or if that's one man. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that Brendan as another beef farmer myself as well. But I'm still trying to see the benefit of blockchain here over and above the current relationship databases that exist. For example, the cattle moving monitoring system, which would be available at all the processors once an animal is slaughtered. I suppose the way I'm, I'm, I'm uh, approaching it on is how can we build, how can farm, farms take control of all this data for their own benefit? Um, all that data of movement and antibiotics and all that builds a picture of how, say, sustainable or how uh, com the competitive advantage of, of farming. And there's a trust and traceability gap in consumers that farmers should be going after. And blockchain could possibly play a role. Otherwise, I just see all this technology as trying to force adoption in on a supply chain that is actually trying to force it back. Uh, and it will be all compliance based. I'm just looking at where is there a carrot here for an industry to take this on? and take some form of control of, of their, their destinies or of their produce. That would be kind of the, the approach I'm taking. I, again, with my minimal understanding of what blockchain does as well, uh, Donna, so you'd have to uh, allow me a bit of leeway on that one. Mm -hmm. I, I know, John Breslin, have you got a, an opinion on that? You're on mute if you are have, talking. But my, my, my point is, uh, and you, know, you, you certainly know more about blockchain than me, but my point, and we can talk about this at the end, is we already have a lot of infrastructures in place. We already have a lot of databases. And maybe we, maybe Carol will touch on this. We just need um, some relationships between those databases. Which... Yeah, and, yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's exactly it. I don't think those relationships... Yeah, I can see what you, what you mean, those relationships between those databases. But ultimately... Say for beef farm and done it, the, the business model is so flawed at the moment, there's absolutely no motivation for a farmer to adopt anything at the moment without it being compliance based. Yeah. Because the business model is broken, the friction is there with their, their supply chain. How, how can this technology allow them, what I'm trying to think of, how can it allow them to build some form of power in the in the supply chain, or at least e equal the power at least. Um, and the only way I can see it doing that is use, using it to try and build build some form of relationship with the users uh, en masse, a sector-wide approach to it. Um, I, I can't see in that sector, now it's, it's different across all sectors, of course, but I can't see how you're going to get that co-creation in, in some of those sectors uh, without 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 some serious um you know it, it, it's not even a, I wouldn't even say it's not um yeah it's a stick based approach I'm trying to trying to see how how farmers it's just from the farmer's perspective I suppose you know, be the way I, I was looking at it we have a question Brendan in the chat so Catherine has asked is there an issue with beef farmers understanding of markets beyond factories which yeah. Relationship. yeah, which which is um, which is a, a lot of the problem in a lot of business models. As you analyze it over various uh, places, primary producers can get stuck into supply chains where supply chain. The perfect position for a supply chain is what they have in the beef industry now. Have your primary producers dispersed uh, with no power, uh, and then he have the economic power concentration of power in the processor and retailer level. Farmers aren't looking over over that. At the consumers, and they're just they're just banging on the back door of the factories looking for more price. I'm what I'm saying is, if there was leadership in the industry, you should be looking across that to see how how you can actually engage the users. Uh, and I think blockchain could play a role there because it could help build trust and traceability. But um, but I, I I don't know the answer to it. Okay. Fantastic, Brendan. Okay, so if everybody will join me in thanking Brendan for a great talk. So thank you very much, Brendan. No problem. Um, sorry, just really quickly, I think there was another question in the chat from Jonathan. We might just have a minute to get to that. Yep. No worries. Sorry, I missed no, that. No. One. So, 
Okay, Jonathan has said, we speak about benefit, but there is risk. Can blockchain through a single event damage a reputation of a farm or a farmer? Uh, I, I would say yes to that. that. That is a high risk for farmers and they will see that is even if they inadvertently um, engage with blockchain and, and there's an, something negative in it. Um, but I think ultimately, if that would be just one single use case. And if I suppose you could, you could use that lowest common denominator should not um, dictate the entire industry, I, I would say the answer to that is Jonathan. If blockchain is to be taken on, it should be taken on as an industry wide thing with, a, with some sort of motivation that makes it better for farmers, not just another job for farmers.